Hey guys, welcome to Practical Home Projects. Today's activity is going to be running electricity to your shed or outbuilding. Um, the first decision you kind of have to make when working on this project is deciding what, how much power you need. Um, you could just run a power cord out here and plug in a few lights. That's actually what we've been doing for the last few months. Kind of the next step up would be to run a feeder line from a GFI outlet on the side of your house or the back of your house. Um, that's going to be a little bit more work because you're going to have to dig that up, you're going to have to install some lights and receptacles, and you're still going to have to get that inspected. However, um, just logistically that's a lot easier than the third step, which is actually what we invested in, which is installing a sub panel. So this is a 60 amp sub panel, and we fed it from our main, breaker, main panel in the house. And uh, this is going to essentially give us as much power as we need. We can divide the circuits out once they hit the shed. And this will really give us a lot of flexibility in the future if we decide to turn this into a small workshop. We can hook up a couple power tools, you can hook up a space heater. Um, there's just a lot of options. So the first big step of this project is digging that trench for your feeder line. So let's go look at that outside. So in a perfect world, we would have been able to run conduit all the way from our main panel straight to our back panel without having to make any sort of junction. Uh, unfortunately, the code requires that if you have more than 360 degrees of cumulative turns in your conduit, that you need a pull-through point. And those turns add up really quickly. You could have some sort of gentle curvature, or obviously the 90 degree turn, as we have here, is going to add into that. So I decided to put a pull-through point right here in the middle, and there's actually another box on the other side of this wall. And that allows us to make a sharp 90 degree turn, and also gives us a spot to pull the wires through as we're going. Um, transitioning from the inside to the outside. So now that we've got the conduit run inside the house, it's going to go through a junction box just on the other side of this wall, come through, hit this junction box, and now it's going to hit our flexible conduit. It's going to go down underground about 18 inches. I'm just going to freehand this little section, and then you can see I've already started digging out the trench. So now we've got the turf cut all the way to the shed, and now I'm starting to dig it down to get to that 18 inch depth that's required for the conduit. And what I'm realizing is that the top part of the soil was pretty soft, and now the bottom part is dried out and it's very difficult to work with. I think what I'm going to do is just knock off the top couple of inches all the way down and then wait for it to rain so it softens it back up. two-thirds of the way through our trench and the ground's drying up so it's getting pretty tough to dig. I'm kind of taking it out one chunk at a time. This Carolina red clay is just turning into little bricks. Um, I'm using the Matic as a measuring tape. So all the way down to the top of this red spot is 21 inches. So I'm trying to dig it around 20-21 inches deep. That way our one inch conduit will be below that 18 inch mark. Um, looks like we've just got a little bit left. So we finally got our trench dug. I'm going to use this liquid tight non-metallic conduit and that is going to go the entire way underground as well as pop up a little bit on the ends. So we've already got our box here. I've already got special equipment just for this tubing. So I'm just going to pop it in. Later on I might make sure everything's nice and snug but for right now we're just going to pop it in. I wanted to go ahead and put a clamp on here so that it wouldn't wiggle straight from the box as we're playing with it in the ground. So now we got that, I am going to run it straight and then we'll put some more clamps on it when it gets to the shed. So 
So we've already got this string started in the crawl space uh, conduit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this little plastic bag tied to a piece of string at the top of this section. And then I'm going to go to the other end of this conduit with a vacuum. And hopefully that vacuum will be able to suction this, what they call a mouse, through the tube all the way to the end. And this should work pretty well because since this is one continuous tube, there is no uh, seam in it or anything. So here we are at the sub panel. I've just disconnected this piece of conduit that connects to it. And I'm gonna hook it up to the hose. So I've actually just taped a piece of tiny conduit to that so I can get a good seal. And then let's see if we can get that plastic bag to follow through. And we got it! So the other day we tried to pull this wire and we only got about six feet down. Um, the wire says that it's a low friction, easy to pull, no lubricant needed, um, but we couldn't pull it. So actually I went to the store and grabbed some of this wire pulling lubricant. So we're going to coat that on as we go through and then hopefully that will allow us to get past these couple turns and uh, to the next junction box. So this lubricant seems to be helping a whole lot, uh, just reducing that friction. So we've got our ground wire connected, our neutral wire connected, so now I'm connecting these two hot wires. So you line up the end of the wire with the length that it says to strip, and then I start slicing around. My wire cutters don't do a six gauge wire, so I'm just doing it with a box cutter. I'll do it with the same on the other one, then we'll insert it, pop it in, and then we should have power. So we just flipped the breaker in the house. So let's flip the main breaker here. Put the light circuit here, and let's hope we have lights. We have lights. So now that we've got our feeder lines pulled through, let's kind of talk about what's going on here at the main sub panel. We've got four wires. We've got one six gauge hot wire. We've got a second six gauge hot wire. That gives us a total of 240 volts of potential. We have a six gauge neutral wire, which allows us to break that to two 120 volt potentials. And then we have this green 10 gauge ground wire that connects this ground bar to our main panel's ground. These two grounds are not, the ground and the neutral are not connected in this sub panel. And you'll also notice that the ground is 10 gauge instead of 6 gauge, which is all that's required um, for a 60 amp sub panel. Um, additionally, you'll notice that there's this solid 6 gauge ground connected to the ground bus bar. This is actually connected to the electrodes outside. So there are two eight foot long grounding rods drilled into the ground. So one is pretty much directly below us here. The other one has to be at least six feet away from that. So I have it about seven feet away. And then those are gonna be connected with an approved clamp of some sort. So this is our outdoor receptacle box. I really like this style because I only needed to drill two little holes for the cables to come from the inside to the outside. And also it's fully metal and the box itself is grounded, and then it's nice and big, so it gives me lots of space to work with my wires. This particular model came with a GFI outlet for any sort of outdoor work we need to do, as well as a switch, which I'm using for a floodlight that we have out here. One of the main considerations for passing code with your project is to think about how you're gonna support and secure your cables. So you'll notice most of the way I just drilled holes through my two by fours, I put three quarter inch holes and they have to be at least one and a quarter inch recessed behind uh, the front face. If they're not at least one and a quarter inch behind, then you'll need to install one of these metal plates. This is to protect that cable in case you decide to put a front sheathing on the front of this. So since those are spaced less than four feet apart, you can just run that all the way around and not have to use any staples. If you go any instance of more than four feet without having any support, you'll put one of these staples in. Those are special electrical staples that are insulated to prevent any rubbing or puncturing of your cables. 
And also, you need to have a securement if you're within 12 inches of the junction box. So I have them right outside the main panel. And then you'll also see this box over here. I have the wires come through the wall straight into the box, but then coming out of the box, I have a staple here before it makes that gap to the next stud. So now that you have all of your wiring hooked up, you're going to need to call your electrical inspector to come out here and check to see if everything's done properly. So I actually did all three inspections at the same time. So we had our direct burial wiring uh, inspection, where they me measured it to make sure that it was buried deep enough. We had our rough-in inspection, where he made sure that all the connections were done properly. And then the final inspection would make more sense for a finished house. But here, he just made sure that I had all my covers on, so I had to run around and put the covers on all the receptacles and on this panel real quick. And then we were passed off and ready to go. So I would like to go over a few uh, good things and bad things that went, went on with this project. Um, for example, a good thing is that I'm really glad we chose to go with flexible conduit instead of rigid conduit. The flexible conduit was very easy to kind of go around a couple of those gentle curves, as well as right when I was coming up to the, to the shed, I had to sort of do a hump and do a couple 45 degrees, and that was very easy to do with the flexible conduit versus a rigid. Um, one of the things that I wish we didn't do was use a cheap masonry string to pull our wires through. They, there is a device called a fish tape, or you can also buy something called a mule tape that does a much better job of pulling your wires through. It won't stretch and it won't scratch your pipes. Um, another good thing that I'm glad we did is as we were getting ready to drive those grounding rods in, it was a pain in the neck hammering with a, just a mallet going at a quarter inch per swing. I read online about a cool way to do it with a bottle of water and uh, just using the, hand, the grounding rod itself to drive that rod in and then we ended up getting both rods in in like five minutes a piece. So that was a definite time saver. Um, so this was our project. All in all, I think it took me about $700 worth of materials. Most of that is in the wiring and the conduit. Um, and I think it was maybe three or four weekends. Like I said before, half the work easily was just digging that trench. So if that's something that you're not looking forward to, then perhaps you can rent a device. I personally kind of enjoyed getting some physical exercise every once in a while. Um, and all in all, I would definitely recommend this project. It made this space much more usable. And I think it really appreciated the value of our home, and I'm sure we'll enjoy this uh, for years to come. So if you guys found this helpful, please give us a like. And if you want to see more videos like this in the future, don't forget to subscribe so that you can get to see those first thing. Um, and if you have any comments, please leave those in the comment section below. Let us know if there's anything we could have done differently, any other information you would like in the future, or just what you like and what you don't like. Thanks, and see you guys later.